and this is Pat McDonald, your host for Vote for Vermont, where our tagline is listening beyond the sound bites. Tonight we have a very different format for you. I think it's a topic you will find fascinating. What we're going to do is talk about um, foothold traps, and we have two groups of people. Okay. We have the Vermont Trappers Association, represented by Bruce Martin, Vice President, and Mike Covey, Cons Conservation Director. And with me in the studio is David Kelly. David, welcome back to Hi, the Pat. show. Hi, Hi. And Brenna uh, Galdenzi, who is the Director of Protect Our Wildlife. I'm going to speak with them for 20 minutes, and then Ben Kinsley is going to talk to the Vermont Trappers Association. And then we're going to give each group 10 minutes, 5, 10 minutes, whatever they need, to, to debate what they heard from the other group. And that's our evening. That's how we're going to do our debate on foothold traps. So welcome. Thank nice you. Nice to see you again, David. This is very interesting. We flipped a coin to see who would go first. So I think just to get the conversation started, why did you decide to take up this cause? You wrote a, a fairly lengthy article in some of our papers about um, that you'd like to see foothold traps abolished. Well, I, th I think you know my family to some extent, and that I grew up in a family of avid hunters and fishermen uh, and outdoors people. And uh, eventually, uh, we owned a, a cabin in the Rocky Mountains in Montana mm. because we've been so passionate about hunting and fishing and being outdoors, especially fishing now. I don't hunt like I used to. Uh, but we... Uh, um, have spent a lot of time outdoors with wildlife. Uh, they've been an important, wildlife's been an important aspect of growing up in my family. And uh, out west, uh, my next door neighbor was a trapper and uh, occasionally I helped him. Um, and uh, that experience uh, made me pause and think about my relationship to wildlife. And uh, I just, uh, uh, living so close to wildlife and, and knowing uh, the kind of everyday struggle faced by wildlife and, and how uh, being free is so important to them and uh, 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 seeing what these traps did, uh, it's nothing like hunting or fishing. Um, it, th what these traps were really uh, hideous and uh, um, had nothing to do with hunting or fishing as I've known okay. it, and, and I decided if I had some time, I should try to stop it. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, I hope everybody will, will seek out uh, David's uh, editorial. It was in several newspapers around. So, uh, uh, Brenna, you are the director of the Protect Our Wildlife, and just quickly, because we only have a few minutes, talk about that, uh, um, that organization and why you're here. The organization started um, in 2015 out of what I felt was a need for better wildlife protection in Vermont. Um, and I wish the time that I had here with you today could just be comprised of showing photos and videos of trapped animals because there's nothing that I could say to you today on TV that would do these animals justice. I urge anybody who's interested in learning more about leg hold or foothold or conibear trapping to Google it for themselves and to see um, the inherent suffering and pain. Uh, prolonged suffering that these animals endure uh, in the name of recreation and tradition um, and hobby. Um, I, I think a really effective thing to do is to look at your cat or dog's paw and see how small and fragile um, you know, their paws are and think about that animal's paw being trapped in between the jaws of a steel jawed leg hole trap, you know, slammed shut on your animal's paw. And then think about that animal sitting there for 24 hours in a trap subject to predation, subject to the elements. Um, it's no different um, if it's a cat or a dog or a coyote or a bobcat, that suffering, that suffering is the same. And it's important to remind people you know, what these animals go through when they're in the trap. Um, they desperately try to free themselves from the trap, so they'll bite at the trap, they'll bloody their gums, they'll break their teeth, they'll chew right through their paw to free themselves. Um, when the trapper does come back to check his or her trap 24 hours later, um, animals aren't even given a humane death. Um, stomping on animals is legal in Vermont. They stomp on the animal's chest to crush the animal's chest, uh, heart and lungs. They bludgeon animals, uh, drown them, suffocate, strangle. Uh, if they're lucky, they get a 22 to the head. 
Um, so I really urge people not to take my word for it, um, but to do their own research um, and to see why this issue is so important to people. I mean, 75% of Vermonters who were recently polled by the University of Vermont Center for Rural Studies um, want to ban trapping altogether. Um, this was a survey that was just done last year. Um, and if I may, just one more mm -hmm, um, example, um, because I don't want any of this to come across as being anecdotal or hyperbole. Um, I was reminded yesterday, in speaking with another wildlife advocate, of a uh, raccoon mom and her kit uh, last year who were trapped in a pond. Um, there were traps set for beaver, and the raccoons were caught in leg hole traps. And uh, the mom raccoon and the kit were side by side, and the raccoon kit chewed her leg off. Mm. Um, and the photo was on our Facebook page. Um, you actually see the raccoon kit. They ended up dying side by side in these leg hole traps, and her, her leg is completely severed. You see the tissue, you see the tendons. She chewed right through mm. her paw. And, and certain animals um, are more uh, predisposed to do that, like foxes and raccoons and coyotes, right. um, especially if their paw goes numb from being in the trap. The traps cut off the blood circulation. Um, they're more prone to chew right through the trap to free mm. themselves. So um, it's just, it's uncivilized, and I, I think it's really important for people to do their own research, um, find out for themselves. Photos and videos don't lie. Um, these aren't photos that you know animal rights activists put together. These are photos and videos that trappers themselves have posted on, right. on the website, right. on whether it's social media. Um, and this is an example of, uh, of prolonged suffering. Um, there's a coyote here who was trapped in Vermont, and you'll see the coyote's left paw. Um, it is swollen. Um, it's bloodied. And just think about, you know, what this coyote went through in the 24-plus hours, you know, he was in the trap. Um, this is from a Vermont dog who was caught in a leg hole trap last year. Um, you see that dog's laceration, that deep laceration on that dog's paw. Right. This is from a vet clinic. Um, and this dog was rescued very soon after he was trapped in a leg hole trap. So imagine an animal who's in a trap for 24 hours, yeah. um, how badly they're, they're, they, would, they would suffer. Um, so are you both proposing that we just, we eliminate, um, in, I've actually been told it's called foothold traps, so I'm Well, that, that's to... interesting, the, 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 the kind of uh, semantics that go around right. here. Um, the, uh, normally what I've called a foothold trap is the kind of trap, uh, a, m a much smaller trap that you would catch a skunk or a raccoon uh -huh. with, or, or a cat for that matter, uh, and they're sometimes called dog-proof traps. This is what would typically be called a leg hole trap. This yeah. is an MB650. Um, this is you what you would- You can hold it closer up here. We, no, to you. Uh, um, th this is an MB650. This is what you would typically catch a coyote or a fox mm -hmm. with. Um, here's an example of, of a little fox uh, in, caught in one of those traps. The, these, traps these traps tend to catch, they can catch an eagle, uh, any kind of uh, 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 owls, uh, we will put these up after the show because people can't see them right now, but we'll put them up um, the, after the, the show. Um, this is one of the advanced uh, leg hold traps with, uh, with four springs instead of two. Yeah. It's a very powerful trap. There's no way you could open yeah, that. Yeah, I was actually hands. trying one of them was so heavy. I was you, trying to open it up. You I need special it. tools to yeah. open this with. This is a con bear trap. This is what we used to use out in Montana. My neighbor, the one I used to help, uh, and that I, um, in any event, we use these for beaver. Um, these get used for fisher, fisher cats as well. Um, these, are, these are impossible to open. If your dog gets caught in one of these, you're in serious trouble. Um, the, uh, 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 there's a special way you can open these with your shoelaces if your dog does get caught. We don't have time to explain that now. Right. Um, but normally, the, the trapper I worked with um, would use a, something like this to open uh, the, those, and these are pretty heavy. I was just gonna say, that's what I couldn't pick up those, before. Those, those close <laughs> the traps. with 90 pounds of pressure per right. square inch. Right. Um, and they can, do, they can do a number on a dog. This is a picture of yeah. a dog yeah. uh, in, in, in one of them. Okay. And, uh, if yes, I, please. And, and they are referred to as, as quick kill, and they're not. You know, the, the right-sized animal would have to enter that trap at the right angle, at the right speed, in order for that, the conibear, quote-unquote, kill traps, to be considered a kill trap. So, um, 
I so, mean, this dog certainly. Yeah, so this this legislative session, do you have anyone supporting a bill for this, or it's just no, a conversation no, no. at this time? To w I think both of us would like to do more to have Vermonters understand these traps. We don't have any plans like that. I, I'd love to see Vermont adopt a law like the Colorado law. Right. Uh, the Colorado law, I think, is a, a wise law. Um, I, I think what's important is to have people understand that the American Veterinary Medical Association opposes these things. The World Veterinary Association opposes these things. The uh, National Animal Control Association uh, oppo strongly opposes these things. Uh, the Wildlife Society, which is an organization of professional biologists, scientists, professors, uh, they did a poll of their 10,000 members some time ago, and the largest percentage were opposed to these things. Mm. Um, so uh, as people begin to understand what these do, more and more I think the most powerful tool is the tool presented by trappers themselves on YouTube. The, the material that is on YouTube today has been put there by trappers. And if people would simply go there and see exactly what is happening and what, what is filmed by trappers, I, I cannot imagine. It's easy to understand why 75% of Vermonters are opposed to these traps. Now, does the Colorado law al allow this with restrictions, or do they just outlaw? There are health and safety exceptions. The, the Colorado law outright says leg hole traps, body gripping traps, and snares are illegal. And then it creates two exceptions, one for health, public health, and another for public safety. Oh, I see. And, and I think, um, and, and it's, it's basically a similar law in Massachusetts, New Jersey, Washington, California, uh, Arizona. Uh, a number of states have moved towards making these illegal. They're illegal in a hundred, over a hundred countries. Every country in the European Union and the Scandinavian countries have all made these illegal. Mm. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Something I didn't touch upon before, um, there's the aspect of prolonged suffering, right, um, that propels me to want to ban trapping. But there's also an issue of indiscriminate nature of trapping. I mean, traps are inherently indiscriminate. So a trap set for a coyote in October or November when the season is open will just as easily trap a bobcat. And it happened, I think it was last year, um, and when the trapper tried to release the bobcat who was trapped out of season, the bobcat ended up dying. Um, and in one year alone, there were 12 American martin. American martin are a Vermont endangered species. Mm -hmm. They look very similar to Fisher. Uh, 12 of them um, that were reported, so potentially more, were killed in conibear traps set for Fisher. Uh, you know, each year, you know, you've got ravens, owls, eagles, dogs, and cats. Um, all these different animals, you know, are caught in these traps because the traps are inherently indiscriminate. Mm -hmm. um, there's a photo here of a barred owl, owl uh, who was trapped in Vermont. Um, he's in the hands, literally, of a wildlife rehabilitator. Luckily, um, the owl was brought uh, to a rehabber and, and was able to be uh, rescued. Um, there was a cat in Fairfax, Vermont, last year um, who you could see here has a, quote-unquote, quick kill conibear trap attached to his leg. Um, this cat was very lucky because he was found by a vet tech, um, oh. and the vet tech brought him um, into the vet clinic. Uh, he had to have his leg amputated. Um, so these stories abound. I mean, every year, um, non-targeted animals are, are trapped, and a lot of them go unreported. And the only reason why I know about a lot of these cases is because my organization has submitted public records requests to the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department, um, and we go through them. And that's how we're able to figure out, you know, some of these instances. There was a raven who was caught in a leg hole trap in a state forest last year who had its leg broken. Obviously, the raven didn't make it. Um, so a lot of these, these unfortunate situations are, are never heard of in the public. Um, and that's one of the things that we're looking to do is just to, to elevate awareness, let right. people know what's going on, and then hopefully they'll rally well, behind the cause. I know we had this discussion a few years ago. Um, when I was working for state government, I just remember having that discussion, but obviously it didn't go anywhere. There's no regulations on the books about this at all, is there? Or, well, or there I... are some regulations. Um, traps in Vermont are supposed to be checked. Well, leg hole traps are supposed to be checked every 24 hours. Right. They aren't always. There's, there's lots of anecdotal evidence of animals starving to death in these traps. Um, I think the conibear traps, when they're put underwater, they're supposed to be checked every three days. Is mm -hmm. that is that it? Mm -hmm. um, 
the, uh, but it, it, the important thing is, is this. As, as someone who spent so much time outdoors in a family of such avid hunters and fishermen, um, the point is, is always to be sure uh, that your prey doesn't suffer. Um, uh, when I'm fishing, I, I don't drag fish around for hours and, and play games with them. I bring them in as quickly as I can if we're going to eat them we kill them. Um, if we're going to release them, we bring them in and we release them. The notion that people would do this for fun, uh, the more I understood trapping, the more impossible it was to, to understand why that would be considered recreational. Hmm. Um, it, it's, uh, um, it, it, to me, um, there's, there's something noble about wildlife. So you're going to be working together to get this education out to people and, and see if we can have this official discussion next year, perhaps? Uh, that, we would love yeah, that. Right. What, what we hope is that more people will go to YouTube and see what the trappers of Vermont and New Hampshire and Maine and Pennsylvania put up as part of their recreational lives. Okay. We want people to see what trappers put on YouTube so they can understand how these traps work. Great. Uh, yes, go ahead. Yeah, we, we, you know, we hear a lot of rationale, you know, for why trapping is relevant. Um, and, you know, I, I have uh, thoughts on each one of those um, when, they're, when they're provided to us. But at the end of the day, as I started off the conversation, you know, we just need to look at the photos and look at the videos. They speak for themselves. Mm -hmm. I don't think in the 21st century where we have ways of doing things, you know, more humanely, that we should still be relying on such antiquated, inhumane, methods of animal capture. Um, and again, you're going to hear you know, a lot of excuses. Um, I, I would, again, ask ourselves, there is a way to do things differently. Other states have done it successfully. Vermont can do it as well. And what do you mean by differently? What kind of examples could you um, I mean, for an example, um, you know, a lot of times people have predators um, problems, you know, raiding their chicken coop. And my organization works with people, you know, how to provide uh, sustainable solutions to mm -hmm. wildlife conflicts, um, because if you're oh, trapping I like and killing, that wildlife conflicts. Yeah, because well, <laughs> I mean, if, if you're if you're trapping and killing, you're leaving a vacuum for the next animal to create the same problem. Same with beavers. Right. I mean, there are so many things that beavers do that provide magnificent meadows, and they provide ecosystems for fish and for heron and for moose, even beaver meadows. And we trap them recreationally. We trap them when they're not even causing a problem. And and you can use beaver baffles. Uh, you can use what are called beaver, beaver limiters. You can, um, there are all kinds of ways to manage mm -hmm. beavers. And the best, uh, quite frankly, the best brook trout fishing in Vermont is, is developed by beavers. Really? And beaver dams. Oh, excellent. Um, by far and away the best brook trout fishing in Vermont. Mm -hmm. Far nice. better than the Vermont Department of Fish and Wildlife. Well, we, well I, sh I should ask the Trappers Association, but is there an economic impact here for, um, is, it, is it part of our economy? The, the money, the stuff that's made out of the furs and... Every no. survey says no. Yeah. no. Every survey says most trappers do it for the fun of it and they hope to break even. Hmm. The trappers themselves, uh, members of the Vermont Trappers Association, have said so on their Facebook pages. Right. Wow. Yeah, I mean, I think pelts, I mean, I think a, a pelt pulled in a high of $13 for a red fox pelt at the uh, NAFA convention in mm -hmm. July of 2017. It's, yeah. it's one of the most depressed fur markets they've seen in decades. Wow. Beaver, otter, pelts aren't selling at all. Um, I mean, and we have trappers themselves tell us that even if they're not making any money, they do it for recreation, for, for, tradition. Right. So no one is, if anything, they might be losing money on trapping right. right now. By the time they spend money on fuel for their snowmobiles and ATVs, checking traps, preparing the pelts, a lot of them are actually stockpiling pelts because they're not selling. Mm. So to hear anyone say that, you know, they're making a living off of this um, is patently false. Right. Any follow-up? Because we just have a few seconds left, but uh, I think you've certainly explained your position well. I mean, I, I'm just, I'm really, really happy um, that the amount of support that my organization has had since we came on the scene in 2015, it tells me that you know, my idea of starting this organization, really, um, people were waiting for it. And I think, you know, trapping, it operates kind of in the shadows. A lot of people don't know about what happens with traps. And my organization has sought to illuminate 
uh, so some of the suffering. Do you want to give a, a website, uh, how it's, to get uh, information? Pro it's protectourwildlifevt.org. That's our website. Yeah. And you can find us on social media, uh, Protect Our Wildlife Vermont. Um, and we have a photo of that poor raccoon kit uh, who hey. chewed her paw off Great. last well, year. Well, we will certainly show uh, as many photos as we can that you brought. Thank you very much, David. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, I can't thank quite you. reach, but thank, thank, you thank you so you much. much. Virtual handshake. Okay, thank you. Hi, I'm Ben Kinsley, and welcome back to Vote for Vermont. This is section two of tonight's show, and we are talking to Mike Covey and uh, Bruce Martin from the Vermont Trappers Association. Uh, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thanks Both for having you. us. Thanks for having us. <laughs> so um, we're talking uh, tonight, we kind of have a, a different format for the show. We actually have uh, almost like a, deba a debate format. So we just had... Uh, David Kelly uh, talk on talking about uh, leg hold traps. You guys are going to get 20 minutes to talk about uh, the Trappers Association, and then uh, you're each going to get 10 minutes to respond to uh, what the other group said. Um, so this is still section two. You guys are going to we're going to talk a little bit about what the Vermont Trappers Association is, what you do, um, and then of course uh, leg hold traps and uh, and all that kind of stuff. So. Um, my first question for you guys is, what is the history of trapping in Vermont? It seems like when we think of Vermont and hunting and outdoor recreation, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the classic pictures of Vermont is the hunter or the trapper out in the woods, uh, you know, doing their thing. So what, what's the history there and what do Vermonters need to know? Yeah, definitely. And, and to correct you, it's actually a foothold trap. Foothold trap. Yeah, we don't hold the legs. Um, trapping has been around you know, since before the Europeans even colonized the Americas, uh, the Indians were doing it with you know, snares and deadfalls, et cetera. Um, you know, obviously we have, have um, brought on the foothold trap when, when the Europeans did come over and that enabled us to modify our sets accordingly. Um, trapping has been used as a source of food, a source of garments to keep people warm throughout the year, and has also been a, a good way to introduce populations of animals to the state. For instance, uh, beaver were introduced back in the 1940s, I believe, and obviously their population has taken off. Uh, right. Fisher have been, were introduced by using trappers in New York and Maine, using the same type of, type of traps we're using here um, still today. And they were introduced to Vermont back in the 70s. Uh, Martin population was introduced back in the 80s. It hasn't taken off exactly as uh, they had hoped it would, but that's also due to extenuating factors, like one of their big competitors is the fisher, and we right. do have a very good fisher population in Vermont. Um, so we have, uh, it, it's been been a, a good introduction to all these animals and all the wildlife, wildlife that individuals in Vermont see now is because they're introduced by trappers. Cool. And it's been a historical pursuit on the landscape, like Bruce said, for centuries, you know, time immemorial. Um, yes, the methods and mechanisms have changed and, and have actually improved uh, quite a bit. So um, so you're saying there's a bunch of species that are here now that are not native to Vermont that trappers have introduced into the ecosystem? Well, they were native okay. and they were extirpated. You know, the European settlers didn't, didn't have, um, they didn't view intrinsic value of animals. If an animal is a competitor with them, then they wanted to eliminate it. Um, so these animals were on the landscape originally, and then they were extirpated, which means locally um, caused to go extinct. And they've been brought back in to reintroduce them, to bring them back. Um, you know, like specifically the beavers do, they are a great creator of habitat. They also have a high rate of uh, reproduction. Um, you know, within eight years of being brought back, they were already having a trapping season on them. It was by permit at that point, but, you know, they brought, brought in a uh, few hundred, and uh, actually not even a few hundred, if I remember correctly. I'd have to look at the numbers. Mm -hmm. but, um, you know, they had 8,000 beavers within a few years. So this is kind of like a similar situation to like um, like catamounts and wolves, which were hunted to extinction here in Vermont. But these species we've actually been able to bring back, and they've seemed to thrive right. pretty pretty well in the environment. Right. The issue with, uh, with catamounts and wolves is that there are so many humans on the landscape at this point, they don't have the the broad areas of habitat that they would need to succeed here to succeed here well and that's the issue we're having with uh, moose also they t they require so much acreage to mm -hmm. succeed that it's difficult to find those types of tracts of land that they can really thrive in right. so um 
let's, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about the Vermont Trappers Association, what you guys do, uh, what, your, what your members look like, that type of thing. Sure. Um, Vermont Trappers Association, you know, we like to uh, provide education. Uh, we were actually the ones that pushed the department to have trapper education be mandatory before people could get a license. It was mm -hmm. something that was being taught before it was mandatory by the association, but then becoming mandatory, you know, we have many educators, you know, across the state, you know, teaching people um, what they can do. And, and you know, our, our other point is, you know, conservation of the habitat. You know, we like to promote the outdoors. We like to get individuals into the outdoors and, and um, experience, you know, the traditions and, and the um, experiences that as, as much as they can. Um, with that, we send kids to conservation camps. Um, we've um, sent many, many females to uh, becoming an outdoor woman. Mm -hmm. We also give out scholarships to kids going to college for uh, environmental studies of some sort. Very we cool. Do that. We do that annually. And uh, so it's kind of like a, similar to what a hunter safety course. You have, in order to, to, to go out and, um, and hunt any species, really, you have to, to have a hunting license and usually you have to have it go through a, a hunter safety course. So this is a similar process to that. It, yes, the, the, the same applies with trapping. Um, you know, and, and they go through regulations. Trapping is the most highly regulated outdoor pursuit in the state. Um, and up until recently, any infraction, even a minor one, such as, you know, if a tag falls off your trap, all your traps have to be tagged with your name and so forth. Mm -hmm. If if you were missing one trap tag, that that would be a violation that would cause you to lose your hunting, fishing, and trapping licenses for three years. So there's pretty strict requirements. They're very strict. Around. Yeah. And so they have to be able, if a game warden's walking through a um, a piece of land and there's traps on it, he has to be able to tell who the traps belong to. Exactly. That's, gotcha. Um, so. Uh, what's the impact on uh, the economy uh, from trapping and hunting in general, even? But but specifically trapping. What's you know what's the is there an economic benefit to the state from it, and what does that look like? The economic benefit of trapping is hard to quantify. Um, you know, you you have the the smaller benefit of of you know whatever folks are able to get for selling their fur, or if somebody's doing um, damage control work, um, you know whatever they charge for their time. But the, the larger benefit that's difficult to quantify is, is um, the benefit to infrastructure, you know, um, removing or, or uh, mitigating road damage from beavers, for instance, or, um, you know, the ability to help with streamside restoration in a riparian zone. You know, if you're trying to grow red maple in a historic um, buffer zone where it would have existed, but perhaps the land has been denuded at some point, it's difficult to get that regrowth in the presence of an active beaver lodge, mm -hmm. say. Um, so there's benefits uh, ecologically as well as economically oh, is what you're saying. Absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. Trapping is actually used to uh, protect the nesting grounds of the spiny soft-shelled turtle, which is a Vermont endangered species. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they nest on the beach and they lay their eggs and go away. It's a very vulnerable uh, situation, especially for an endangered species. And is trapping um, any more or less effective than hunting in certain in certain situations, uh, either to control uh, certain types of animal populations or with things like ecological systems? Is there an advantage to trapping over <coughs> hunting, or is there? Is there trapping is actually um, for many fur bears. It's the only legal method of of harvesting them, so it's a very effective means. Um, to control these populations. A lot of the, the fur bearers are nocturnal, you know, times that they can't be hunted at all. Um, and we can, we can actually set our traps according to these, um, these animals that we want to target based on, you know, the population mm -hmm. and, uh, and what is around. But so it could be, because it's not legal to hunt after, uh, after nightfall, correct? Because of safety concerns about not being able to see your targets and it, that type of thing. It is actually lawful for some animals. For but, some animals. But there are some animals, uh, some fur bears that are trapped. Um, otter and fisher come to mind off the top of my head that these, these animals can only be harvested by trapping. Um, okay. It's not lawful to shoot them. All right, and just for our audience, what are fur bears? What kind of animals are those? We're not talking about black bears here necessarily. No. What you know? What kind of animals are we talking about? Um, mink, muskrat, beaver, uh, possum, um, coyote, fox, bobcat, fisher. So basically, raccoon, basically raccoon. almost any furry animal. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, so frame uh, this issue for us uh, around uh, foothold traps in Vermont. What is the um, what do people have concerns about? Uh, what are you guys doing to address those concerns? 
Well, a lot of times I think people just don't understand it. You know, we have this, this we get this picture in our head, uh, a lot of times courtesy of Walt Disney, of these great big massive steel tooth jawed um, horrific things, uh, which they're not, you know, and, and um, was there a time when there were tooth jawed tra traps? Yes, there was, but they haven't been legally in use for decades. Um, and they aren't even manufactured at this time. Right, yeah. so you, when you see these things from like, uh, uh, like Fox and the Hound, and you have right. this huge, right. Right. you know, like this yep. huge trap that has these yep. uh, jagged teeth, and the farmer gets his leg stuck in it. It's those, those aren't the types false. of traps that we're t that we're actually talking Correct. about. So, what do these traps actually look like? I know um, Dave showed a, a couple examples, but it, it was kind of hard unless you looked get a right. closer picture um, of it to figure out what the thing actually does. The MB is an example. It's one of the larger examples. The MB six hundred and fifty, one of the largest examples of a foothold trap. You know, and we have foothold traps that are that big with the jaws spread open. Mm -hmm. And, and um, so, so, you know, there's a lot of misconception about, you know, even if, you, if, you, if a human stepped on an MB, they would just pull their foot out. You know, that trap can't even spring around your foot. It's gonna spring underneath your foot when you pull it away, but it's not gonna clamp onto you, you're not gonna be captured, you're not gonna have to saw your foot off to get out or any of that. Um, another thing is that I think there's an, an image of traps are just scattered about and you just throw them out there and an animal comes and gets in them and it's um, far more complex than that. We can specify the animal we're after based on the amount of tension it takes to set the trap off. We can adjust that. You know, if, if we have a trap set for a coyote, we're going to set it farther away from the bait than for a fox because they're uh, a smaller animal. A smaller animal needs a different trap placement. And if you set the trap in an area the animal doesn't naturally habituate, you're never going to catch anything. You know, it's not a willy-nilly. It's it's a almost scientific um, approach. So uh, one of the things I'm curious about. So you know, there's a couple examples of uh, you know domestic um, pets getting stuck in traps like this. What do you do to avoid? How often? Well, first, how often does that happen? And what do you do to avoid um, situations like that where a, a, a pet might accidentally get caught in one of these traps? And I, I think it's, um, you know, we aren't in a location that you know, people are going to be traveling very often. Mm -hmm. um, it is port important to know that everybody who intends to trap must have landowner permission. Uh, so the landowner should know that they're going to be there and trapping and, and should notify anybody. But we're not, we're not setting these traps in locations that people are are heavily walking with their, their pets or their dogs. Um, we're setting in, the, in locations that we expect to find these animals, which you know tend to stay away from those locations anyways because they want to stay away from the human or the uh, animal sense. So we are normally far enough away that it does not happen that often. Uh, an aspect of it, um, which I think is kind of a, a failing on our part, is that you know generally case law supports the idea that you're responsible for your animals, you're responsible for your pets, your domestic livestock, whatever. You know, if, you're, if your horse gets out and it destroys your neighbor's garden, we don't say, well, they shouldn't have planted a garden. We say, you needed to have control of your horse. And by state statute, you are supposed to have control of your pets. Um, I think that, you know, an awareness is important, an awareness of the timing of the trapping season, an awareness that with a thousand members in the Vermont Trappers Association and an average of 600 licenses, give or take, sold annually, there's quite a bit of trapping going on on the landscape. So um, people certainly need to be cognizant of when those seasons are open and, and uh, you know, maintain the best control of their pets that they can. Right. So what, um, what regulations are there um, in the state of Vermont over trapping and what protections do they offer um, to animals that aren't intended to be trapped, but also, you know, um, you know, domestic animals that might become trapped. So what are, what are the regulations that kind of oversee uh, trappers in Vermont? Well, there are quite a few regulations. It's the most regulated uh, sport there is in the state of Vermont. And we have special regulations based on, you know, size and location for some, um, some seasons. Um, there are special regulations in wildlife management unit uh, E because there's a, potential for, for lynx traveling through. So we have special regulations that the Trappers Association worked with the department to, uh, to generate um, to prevent any lynx being caught and to make, make a avoidance uh, key. But it is uh, 
definitely the most highly regulated um, sport there is out, out there. An another regulation to speak to your point, um, the, the body gripping trap that um, Ms. Galdenzi had with her, um, that's a, a 330 is the size designation. At no time is it ever legal to set that trap on the ground. Um, it has to be set either six feet above the ground or in the water. Those are the, those are the regulations for that. Um, and there are sizes below that 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 applies to as well. Um, so what so, kind of animal would you be trying to trap with a, with a trap like that? The 330 beaver. Be beaver. beaver, yeah. So, so that's beaver the really water. the only thing that you would, you would target with that trap. Gotcha. And, that, and that is the thing with, you know, even, even uh, the cona bears and, and the footholds is that they come in a variety of sizes. So we're going to change what traps we use based on, on the animal that we're targeting. And, um, you know, we've talked a little bit about this, but there's been a significant change in the types of traps uh, over the years and, and the, the technology that's available. We Absolutely. saw two types of traps that um, the other group brought, brought with them. Uh, are there other examples of, of newer style the, traps? The biggest change has been in uh, best management practices testing. So there was, um, and the Vermont Trappers Association was a partner in this for the five years that this was undertaken in Vermont. Um, in the 80s, the European Union um, was, was starting to question trapping um, and question you know, fur and, and the welfare of the animals being taken by those methods. Um, so over the last three decades, roughly, uh, there's been about $6 million spent on analyzing traps, analyzing their effects on the animals. Um, so, and this was done by trappers volunteering their time and biologists going along with them on their trap lines and cataloging any injuries, any um, distress and whatnot that whatever animal is caught in whatever trap. So through these, we've been able to develop what are called BMPs, best management practices, for every fur bearer in North America, um, with the exception of the wolverine, is still in testing. Um, and those those best management practices, when applied, minimize uh, trauma and minimize um, any potential for damage. And, you know, the the whole point was to improve the welfare of trapping, and it really has brought trapping into a new century. Yeah, and I, and I think, um, you know, perhaps the perception uh, for a lot of people is trapping is kind of like an old, uh, an old way of doing things. And, and it sounds like there's a lot of new technology going into this and a lot of new techniques that are going into this. It's not just throwing a trap out in the woods right. and hoping you catch something, you know. Well, if you consider the trapper's uh, conundrum, you know, a hunter needs to get within, you know, if you're bow hunting, say, maybe 30 yards, 90 feet of your, of your prey. And then you can close the rest of that distance at a high rate of speed with your projectile. You know, with a rifle, it's even farther, two, three hundred yards, pretty conveniently. A trapper, that animal has the whole world to walk across, and a trapper has to convince it to put its paw right here. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's, it's definitely a science. So we've got about uh, two minutes left. I have two questions quickly, and then um, and I'll kind of open it up to you guys. So how often do trappers typically check their traps? They're required by law to check their traps daily. Daily. Um, with the exception for. of fatal sets underwater um, can be left for three days. And, and one of the great benefits of that, you know, it's for one, the animal's dead. For two, it's underwater. Um, it's always in the colder months of the year. So it's not decomposing. It's not losing any value um, in terms of food or in terms of fur. And if there's a significant rain or melting event like the one we recently had where water levels really rose, it allows the trapper to um, you know, give the water level some time to come down, and it really is a safety function. Right. So on, you're not forced level. to go get right. that trap. Right. In you, a have, you have you have a three day. Yeah. Um, you know, trappers watch the weather because we know we have to be out there every day. Yeah. Um, and so. do some trappers check it more than every 24 oh, yeah. hours, or is that is that considered best <laughs> practice? Or is um, it? I don't know if it's considered best practice, but I know I can't speak for everybody. For myself, um, I I often check morning and evening because. It's exciting, you know. Yeah. Um, um, it is a science. It is an art, and there is a, a benefit to it. So, but like we we did mention before, I don't want to waste time on this. But we um, you know, these these animals are basically nocturnal. Right. So I mean, there's a whole lot of the day that they're not going to be moving. So they're not in a trap for 24 hours. Yeah. And um, so, and when do things go wrong? When do you catch uh, animals um, that you weren't intending to catch? Uh, and um, and 
you know, what do you do to remediate that? Or you have someone who's maybe not following the rules and uh, putting traps in an unsafe location. How do you address the, those things? If you have issues? somebody who's not following the rules, they're not a trapper, there's a poacher, and there's a distinction. Just like uh, somebody who shoots a deer out of season yeah. is not a hunter, they're a poacher, they're a thief. And, um, and do you guys uh, make an effort to, to like hold each other accountable to make Absolutely. sure that, that, that's, that you're all yes. following best practices? Right. Yeah. You know, um, I have no patience for that. And I don't know anybody who's a reputable uh, outdoors person who does, you know, regardless of what we're talking about, regardless of which aspect of that we're talking about, whether it be trapping, hunting, hounding, any of it. The re cool. regulations are put there for, for a reason, and yeah. when the situations like that happens, it actually makes us all look bad, unfortunately. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, who has the most vested interest in any resource? The folks who are utilizing it. Cool. So do you, um, I, I'm going to give you a 30 seconds. Um, is there anything else that you want to communicate to the audience about uh, trappers and, uh, and what you guys do? Yeah, the importance of the foothold trap um, can't be overstated. It's versatile, it's adaptable, it's adjustable, and it allows us to do things, you know, there, there's a, trappers work with fish and wildlife departments and with even um, university biologists to um, trap animals for study and then be able to release them. And the foothold allows us to do that um, very well. You know, BMPs uh, were a great aid in that, but you know, we can we can trap animals in a foothold. Um, a biologist can come in, can take any data sets they need or whatever, um, and we can release them. We can track them with a collar. Um, so, from a biological perspective, they're invaluable. Um, and from a functional perspective, as a trapper um, and and as a, a tool in the wildlife management toolbox. Um, the same applies just because of their versatility. Awesome. And I, I would just say quickly that, um, you know, if anybody does have any questions about trapping, if they're kind of like on the fence about it, feel free to reach out to us. I mean, we are always willing to, you know, explain trapping to them or show them what, what we do and you know, show them how to set a trap um, if they ever, you know, would like to. Um, we do have a website at vermonttrappers.com. We have a whole list of directors with their contact information so they can always reach out to anybody that's uh, local to them. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Great. Thank awesome. you. We'll be right back uh, with the rebuttal. Hi, it's Pat McDonald back again. And uh, this is the rebuttal part of the program. Uh, Brenna and David are going to start off. They have ten, up to 10 minutes. They don't have to take the whole 10 minutes to rebut what they just heard from the Vermont Trappers Association. And I am going to attempt to keep quiet. We'll see how that goes. Go Brenna, ahead. Ladies first. Okay. Brenna, you well, thank you. Yeah. Uh, the first thing that stood out to me was the issue of selectivity. Um, again, the pictures that I showed when I first was talking, traps are inherently indiscriminate. Uh, Mr. Covey knows that otters are trapped each year in traps set for beaver in March. Um, traps also catch, again, eagles, owls, ravens, dogs, cats. A Canada goose was trapped last year. Um, so to say that they're highly selective, um, I think is disingenuous. A black lab caught, was caught in a conibear trap last year and died. Um, I can give examples, you know, ad nauseum, um, and I can provide them if someone wants them. Um, there's also the issue of trapping being highly regulated. Um, there are certainly laws governing trapping, um, but traps may be placed on public lands, including national wildlife refuges. Um, trappers are not required to set the traps back off of any distance off of trailheads. They aren't required to erect signage as to where they're trapping. Um, if you're walking your dog on a retractable leash, it's very possible the dog can get caught in a trap. Um, and up until uh, this year, trappers were not required to report when they trap an endangered species. So if trappers trapped a American marten, let's say, a uh, Vermont endangered species, they weren't even required to report that. So to say that it's highly regulated, I, I highly disagree with that. David, you have some I, I, I guess I would add, uh, uh, when I was uh, out, when I was in Montana uh, helping uh, my neighbor with trapping, especially with the body gripping traps, they were planted underwater. Um, and uh, uh, a lot of the fishermen like me fish with their dogs. Uh, and in fact, when, when I had a bird dog, my bird dog, Tori, um, she, she, we're walking in the woods, she's all over the place, pointing at everything. Um, 
the, these, these traps are laid like landmines, and they're out there. Um, you don't go out with a, uh, a rabbit dog or a bird dog on a leash. Um, they're, they're out running around, and, and quite frankly, uh, one of the things I always worried about when we were laying traps on irrigation ditches or spring tree, creeks on, on ranches in Montana was um, a fisherman coming along, and they do. Fishermen come along, they don't know where these traps are, and they step into them. Fortunately, most fishermen are wearing boots, and, and they, they are not badly hurt. But let me tell you, one of the things I find interesting is the effort made by the trapping community to change the language. Uh, instead of calling it a, foot, a leg hold trap, they want to call it a foothold trap. And it doesn't matter if we call it a toe hold trap. All you've got to do is look at the consequences and the damage these things do. Again, I want to emphasize to your audience, go to YouTube. Don't take my word for it. Don't take anybody's word for it. Look at what the trapping community has put out there as the consequences of their work. You can see it for yourself. I think this discussion about best management practices is um, it's, it's essentially a public relations issue. These folks understand that more and more people like me, um, I, I'm not some wild PETA member. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm an outdoors person and I lived, um, one of my best friends was a writer for Field and Stream magazine for outdoor life. You know my dad, you know he was an avid deer hunter. Um, th to, it's like putting lipstick on a, on a pig. It, it, the best management practices is, is nonsense. Look at what these traps do to animals. And you can see it today on the internet, on YouTube. And that is, is the most compelling argument on behalf of making these things illegal. Right. Well, we've got five more minutes if you want to say, but if not, I can, are there any states that have, like you were mentioning, um, maybe a flag where the where the um, a trap is. Are there any states that allow um, trapping, but with all kinds of um, notification or something that that maybe as a second stage or something would be acceptable? There are, um, at the very least, to um, set back traps off of trails. Right. I mean, right now, I mean, as I said, you can be walking your dog on a retractable leash. If a trap is set not too far off the trail, you know, your dog can get caught. Um, you know, we advocate people leashing their dogs, you know, for the safety of wildlife and keeping cats indoors. But the reality is cats and dogs go missing every day in Vermont. I read about it all the time. And I bet a lot of those animals were caught in traps and never seen again. Um, and if I could, I just want to touch upon one last thing with respect to wildlife management. Yes, they always please. talk about, you know, using trapping as an excuse to, to manage wildlife populations. And I guess my question is, why are you trapping and killing those very animals like bobcats and fisher and coyotes who do a magnificent job of managing small mammal populations. If you're really concerned about the populations of foxes becoming overpopulated, then why are people like Mr. Covey in favor of an open season on coyotes? Coyotes prey on foxes. Hmm. Um, so I guess that I have a hard time understanding. If we're really concerned about wildlife populations, then we shouldn't be killing carnivores and predators. They do a fantastic job of taking down, you know, the old, the weak, the injured, as nature intended. Um, and predators, you know, coyotes and bobcats, they do a fantastic job managing their territories, their, their territorial animals. Mm -hmm. So only so many bobcats and coyotes, and beaver for that matter, will inhabit a certain space. They won't allow for more animals in their right. territory. So there's so many different ways that nature works magnificently um, in managing itself. And for us to think that we need to use these antiquated, you know, leg hole traps and conibear traps to fix this, to fix these problems, um, I, I think is very misleading. Hmm. Okay. Any last thoughts, David? Um, I, I guess it's, it's my hope that uh, more people in the hunting community um, will come forward and, and speak up, more fishermen, more outdoorsmen. Um, I've, I've talked to a lot of my friends uh, who do hunt, and I, I think there's a sense of, uh, w well, w w we can't do this, we'll get the trappers mad at us. Um, 
And I, I think that has to change because this trapping and hunting, they don't have a lot in common. Mm -hmm. um, hunters uh, hunt a specific animal with skill. They kill it quickly, making every effort mm -hmm. to minimize pain and suffering. And um, this, isn't, this has nothing to do with hunting. Um, the last thing a hunter or a fisherman wants to do is, is, is make an animal suffer. Um, I, I, I just know um, that uh, I, I worked with a hunting guide, a, a licensed uh, hunting guide out in Montana occasionally, and the hunters that uh, came into the Rocky Mountains uh, hunting elk, they hunted with skill and care and respect for the animal. Um, and uh, to, to do this, to, to grab an, an animal, leave it injured, leave it suffering, leave it trying to chew its, its leg off so it can get free again, um, no self-respecting hunter would, would do anything like that. Right. Well, I thank you both very much. We will now turn it over to the Vermont Trappers Association. Close the show. Thank you. Welcome back. Uh, this is the final segment of tonight's show. Uh, we're talking to the Vermont Trappers Association. Uh, they have a 10-minute rebuttal uh, to the, the comments from the, the previous group. Um, so I'm just going to turn it over to you guys um, and let you respond uh, to some of the things you heard and, and uh, tell us uh, you know, what your thoughts are about uh, foothold traps. Well, I think a really key note, you know, Ms. Galdenzi mentioned um, re basically removing humans from the equation entirely. Why don't we let nature take its course? Um, and, and that's a, really a false paradigm. Uh, humans have always utilized wild game. We've always utilized wild resources in general. And, and there's nothing, you know, wrong. There's nothing ill about that. It's, it's right. Uh, I always say that humans are not apart from nature. We are a part of nature. Um, you know, and we can't separate the human species from its environment and, and all the other inhabitants of that environment. Um, you know, the, the hyperbole of, of animals being stomped to death in traps, um, you have to, uh, no, it's not statutorily forbidden, but you have to think very poorly of someone to think that that's going to be an acceptable um, undertaking for any decent human being. And, and the fact that, uh, you know, that Ms. Galdenzi's group and, and certain other groups in the state have a very negative opinion, and they're putting out a very negative narrative about trappers. Um, we're not the only group that have come under attack from them. Um, by far, we're not the only group. But we certainly have borne the brunt of it. Um, you know, terms like uh, Ms. Gildenzi uh, used, you know, uncivilized and inhumane. And um, uh, David said, you know, no self-respecting hunter would use a trap. Um, you know, commonly in social media, the word sociopathic, psychopathic, um, you know, mentally, dis you know, mentally disturbed, those are all thrown out. And that's a really negative narrative to take up about fellow members of your community, you know? Um, it, it gets way off topic of the actual facts of the matter, and it starts becoming a, a smear campaign. Um, we don't accept that, you know, with other minorities. You know, we've heard from all of these groups regularly, trappers are a minority. So essentially, you know, the statement is our voice doesn't count, you know? Our interests don't count, our lifestyle doesn't count. Um, because it's a minority of the population, you know, which it is. There are 600,000 individuals in the state of Vermont, a thousand of them are involved in the Trappers Association, 600 of them buy licenses, there's overlap. You know, some aren't in the association that buy licenses and some don't buy licenses they're in. But they're all members of the community. You know, we don't accept that type of narrative directed at our LBGT community, at our developmentally disabled communities. Um, you know, any of our various ethnic communities. We don't accept it. Why would we accept it directed at the trapping community? Uh, people in the trapping community are doctors, they're lawyers, they're mothers, students, you know. They're all contributing to your community in other ways. And they're also contributing, you know, um, in terms of 
managing these wildlife populations, you know, of um, mitigating situations like uh, two years ago, there was a huge distemper outbreak uh, in the central Vermont area, and it was bad. APHIS was taking in roughly 30 animals a week uh, wow, that crazy. were dying of canine distemper, primarily affected raccoons, foxes, and coyotes. Well, canine distemper is a density-dependent disease. In a healthy population with enough dispersal, it doesn't transmit well. When you have that much transmission of that disease in that short of a time frame, it was a few months, um, there's a significant issue, you know. Um, I, I, I had to uh, deal with a raccoon in a playground in the middle of Berry City at 10 in the morning. Um, I at first thought it was rabid, it turned out it had distemper. You know, game warden was an hour out. This thing's on a, on a playground. And so, you know, I offered, I offered assistance and, and uh, you know, the game warden later came and picked it up, sent out for rabies testing and, and uh, you know, it wasn't rabid, it was distempered, but it was a significant problem. And, you know, frankly, it, it would be a positive thing to have more trapping on the landscape to keep these populations at a mitigated level. Can nature take care of itself? Yes, but it's ugly. You know, it's starvation, it's disease. And, it, and we never eliminate the peaks and valleys in wild populations, they fluctuate. You know, predator follows prey. So if a prey population expands, the predator population can expand, then the predator population overwhelms the prey population, and then the predator population starves out, the prey population can expand again. By trying to keep things more in balance, we can mitigate all of that um, suffering. You know, we can, we can mitigate those huge peaks. We can't ever get rid of them. We always have that fluctuation, but we can help it. And well, just that's to, kind of on the same a topic we, we mentioned briefly earlier. Of we've removed a lot of the larger carnivores from right. the from the system, the, mm -hmm. you know, and and so we either have to fill that void or you know what happens. Exactly, right. and, and to, to add what what Mike was saying is that I mean it's it's basically like an S curve. I mean you have your peaks and you have your valleys with these populations. A happy population is like right in the middle. You take away that S curve. S curve. I mean, when you have the carnivores high, they're going to be eating a lot of their prey, and the prey is going to go away. Also, with the high population, they're more perceptible to, to disease. And when it goes, they get disease, it spreads and spreads, and it brings it down to the, the sag of the S-curve. The prob problem with sag is it takes a lot longer to come out of, to get back to, to the uh, a healthy population. Uh, 20 years ago, when I first started trapping, we had rabies come through this area, all of Vermont, and the fox, the skunk, the raccoons were basically taken out of almost of existence. There were small populations around and it took, took years for it to get back to a healthy population. Uh, so by harvesting these animals, I mean, they are talking about being humane. Mother, mother nature isn't humane. And I've, seen, I've had to deal with animals with mange, animals with rabies, animals with distemper, and it's not a pretty sight. So by keeping these populations in check and preventing that is, uh, is just helpful to everybody. I mean, people, people get sick and we don't take flu shots away from them. So it's, it's basically the same. Another, uh, another part of that, that narrative which opposes this um, is the idea that somehow trappers and hunters are stealing wildlife from the general public. And, and that's patently untrue. Wild populations are being maintained currently at higher levels and healthier than they were at the turn of the century by far, um, you know? And, and so there's a surplus population. Nature requires a surplus, right? Uh, winters are difficult, especially in Vermont. You know, we just had a significant stretch of sub-zero weather. So nature requires a surplus to be created in the spring. And a, a great percentage of that surplus will die during the winter. We can, again, mitigate those deaths because if you have a, you know, you have a carrying capacity to land, so you have a certain area. If you have the ability to feed five deer in this area, and there are eight deer in the area, all eight of those deer are going to eat until all eight of those deer are weak. And you may lose five or six of them once they start starving, because you're only kind of, the only ones that are going to make it through are the ones that were still the strongest when everybody got weak. If you take three of those deer initially, and you have enough food there to maintain all five of those deer in a healthy status through the winter, you've eliminated suffering, you've utilized the surplus. Um, you know, that's just, you know, that can be applied to 
to any species. Um, yeah, we've, um, I mean, we've had instances like, you know, a coyote doesn't realize if there are two rabbits left in the woods that they, he can't eat those two rabbits. He's, it's just in his blood and his nature that to yeah. eat those for food. They don't have the cognitive ability to manage resources exactly. the way that humans like, can. Like yeah. we can. I mean, with the, the foothold traps, it, it allows, allows us the option to to approach the animal. You know, we can see what it is from male, female, et, et cetera. And if it's something that we want to allow to go back into the to the wild to reproduce and, and grow uh, this, the um, certain species in that area, we can let them go. And they run away unharmed, um, done it many, many times. So we, we have that. <laughs> that ability to uh, promote the... So we've got about 20 seconds left. Uh, is there anything you want to say in, in the last 20 seconds here um, to, to communicate uh, to Vermonters? I, I would say that it's an important note that, um, you know, traditionally sportsmen and women, hunters, trappers, um, even fishermen, have been the, the first to notice any issues, any concerns within a wild population, and they're pretty vocal about it. They bring that to their fish and wildlife departments and say, hey, what's going on here? Um, you know, trapping is, is supported by the World Wildlife Fund. It's supported by the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. And it really is, um, it's not antiquated. It's a valuable tool. Um, it's been updated. You know, everything needs to be updated at times, and it has been. And, and um, it continues to be, and will continue to be, a valuable tool and a valuable lifestyle um, on the landscape, you know? Um, we have people who are still making their own clothes from fur. You know, we have people who utilize it in crafts, people who, who get more income than perhaps they would by just selling the fur, by utilizing the whole animal, cleaning the skulls, selling the skulls, using the meat. Um, it, it really does have benefits for, for the individual, for the community, and for the resource itself. Awesome. Well, thank you, guys. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for coming. Thanks. Appreciate and, it. And uh, thank you for listening. Um, you know, if you like the format, this is a little bit of a different format for us. Uh, please write to us, let us know. Uh, you can reach us at voteforvermont at gmail.com. Um, and then uh, until next week, uh, keep listening beyond the sound bites. Thank you.